All right, next I'm going to ask, what obstacles do you face pursuing different avenues for partnership? Uh, so that's a great question. Uh, lots of obstacles. Uh, it's just telling, you know, just like we were talking about this morning, telling stories it's about what are all the services that the DMV provides. A lot of people don't realize we also collect for the boats. You know, we, we do registration for boats and vehicles. We do driver's licenses. We do insurance lookups. We do, uh, you know, we're providing all the data for all the insurance companies to rate your insurance on your vehicles when you call in. All of that is data that the DMV is providing, but a lot of people don't realize that. So you have to tell the story about what, what does the DMV do and what are all the services that we can provide and might need to provide. So a lot of times it's just having that, that conversation. Um, I, have, I feel like I'm a sales, I've always been a salesperson. I feel like I sell the DMV when I'm calling and talking to different uh, rural markets. That's one of the, the areas that I have uh, the most difficulty is, is trying to get uh, comm commission agents and agents that will actually provide DMV services in really small, uh, in, in small remote areas uh, because they have their own needs and they have, you know, a employee that does you know, 10 different things thinking about can they also provide DMV services. It becomes a bit of a discussion about well, here's what we, here's how many uh, you you would have to do, and this is what we can provide you. So, what would you describe as the internal impact on the DMV itself by a building all of these partnerships? What's happened with overhead? What's happened with efficiency? Mm -hmm. um, so efficiency is, uh, in just in the last three years, we've been able to take our wait times from the 40 minutes down to, you know, 14 minutes uh, average for the for last year. So just by looking at the systems that we had in place for the number of customers walking in the door, we were able to drive more customers to the business partners and to the other options that they have, you know, whether it be online services, business partners, commission agents, and just giving the customers the different areas that they can do. So now almost 30% of our business is done by a different type of, of agent or partner. So one last question for you. I want you to look into the crystal ball. What do you see as the future for DMV and its partnerships? Uh, I, so looking into the crystal ball, um, so the, I believe the future would be more online services and, and more um, partnerships. You know, how, how could I, uh, how could we um, spend more time or give more products and services to the business partners so we our employees to be more of the auditors and the, and the back-end support for the, for the, uh, the partners. I would love to be able to provide IT support for them on the weekends and the, out, and the hours that they don't have. Sometimes it, it is a little difficult, but just growing it so, so we can get up to, you know, maybe 50% of our services are provided by those different types of activities. It's smarter, it's quicker, it's more efficient, um, and, it, and it, uh, it just, it's the right thing to do. So we're going to move over to Chris now and get get the other side of the story, isn't that? Oh no, the rest of the story. The rest of the story. I'm going to date myself. I, I heard about it from my grandparents. Um, Paul Harvey. No. So we're going to get the rest of the story. So Krista, if you would, really briefly, how did you get introduced to the DMV Partnership Program, and what does that look like from your end? What happened? What happened? Well, so how we were first introduced um, was in 2004, the DMV director at the time was Dwayne Danuk, and he contacted us and said, hey, we're launching this new program. Is there any interest? And um, there was absolutely, yes, interest. Um, and we now have five locations across the state. Um, kind of following up on that, how, how did we really get started mm -hmm. was Young ambition. I was 24 years old. Um, I like a challenge now. Back then, I really liked a challenge, and I thought that it was a great idea. The wait time in Palmer was uh, about four to four and a half hours at the time to go to the state-run DMV. And as you know, the Matsu Borough is the size of West Virginia, so with one 
state-run office, so everybody had to travel, sometimes great distances. So then we opened up in Wasilla. Um, I was part of the organization that already had relationships with the Department of Labor, the Alaska Commission on Post-Secondary Education, and DMV. So I was well aware of the dynamics and the opportunities of having a private sector government uh, collaboration. So um, I'm going to go back to when you first got involved. Mm -hmm. Share with us some of the deciding factors that made you say, yeah, I want to, I want to do this, and I want to see where I can go with it. Um, you know, I just uh, honestly am kind of a person. At the time, I was very young, so I didn't have a lot of data points like we've been talking about today or statistics, although I did get in college and I did pass. <laughs> I might have paid attention a little bit more in my master's program, I'll be honest. Um, so it, I just, it was kind of really just based off of what, you know, what do they call it, like the, uh, the napkin business philosophy, right, where you jot down some numbers about your population, the wait times, could you make it work? And so that's really, um, that's really just kind of how it happened. Now we look at it a little differently, right? When we, we go to open up in a new location, um, we have a very close working relationship with DMV, and so we do use the data on where is a business partner, where is a state office, and that kind of thing, and we try to look for holes in the gaps to be able to go in and open up a new location in a community. What were some of the obstacles you had to overcome in creating a business partnership with the state? Yeah, that's, a, that's such a great question because I think as with any new relationship, there's always obstacles. And we had an extremely supportive director with CMB when we first opened. And uh, there was, I think, three people in the contract services is that unit? Is that what you guys call it? Mm -hmm. The DMV or group? And so they were very supportive. We did have to work very hard, though, at changing some existing cultural attitudes so that we were seen as a partner and not an, as an adversary. Mm -hmm. So uh, that did happen. Um, additionally, it took a little, I think if there would have been um, improved communication when there was the launch of the program, mm -hmm with the business community, dealerships, financial institutions, that kind of thing, there would have been a lot more early adapters to it. The program actually started off stronger than it did. It's been 15 plus years now. Um, so just to kind of get the buy-in from those guys to say, no, you can use us, we're legit, you know, that kind of thing. Now they love us, so it's good. Um, then I, I have to, I was told to be honest. So I'm being honest. Um, there's the, the political arena. And um, we were not always fortunate enough to have a Marla Thompson at the home um, and a supportive uh, DOA. And so anytime there was a change in leadership, we have over the years had issues where we didn't have, you know, bureaucrats in DOA or DMV directors that saw the true business need of the partnership. And so um, they would, one specific example was they didn't like a sign that I had on a building for five years. And it was a threat of, you don't take it down, I'm pulling your contract. And as a business owner, when you put your blood, sweat, tears, every dollar you have into a company, and to have things like that happen where you're constantly battling, um, they tried and to add amendments to the contract for wanted our logo reviewed, our color schemes, um, our email signatures, the way that GCI had our phone tagline, you know, or what's it called, the, when you call, color ID. thank you, the caller ID, um, and um, even our fax cover sheets, guys, who faxes anymore? So um, it was things like that, and again, like before Marla's time, just to be clear. So we did have, those were, those were a lot of obstacles. Um, my first Mother's Day, Unfortunately, it was through our foster relationships, though, that we keep worked very hard with DOA and DMV. I was contacted by leadership my first Mother's Day weekend, 12 years into running the company, and said, you got to get to the office. There's a floor session that is happening right now, and there are multiple amendments that are trying to shut you down. So I had to leave my newborn baby with my husband, go to the office, and start making calls like crazy, emails, text messages, you name it, we were looking up everybody 
Um, and there was, it was a 16 hour day and there was amendment after amendment after amendment um, just because the policy was weak in the understanding. I think you kind of talked about the packaging of the message and um, we were fortunately, we were able to defeat that. But as you're looking for your own departments or divisions to do the private sector government relationship, just keep in mind that a true partner would not change the rules on each other midstream. This is true. I called. Yeah, you did. She did. And I went to work. <laughs> Still, you know, as my first child, not very happy about how I spent my weekend, but it's what I had to do. So um, you've mentioned some of the things that the state could do differently or think about when they mm -hmm. start to build this partnership. What other support services do you think the state could provide or perhaps there's an intermediary that could provide to help build those partnerships, make them solid faster? Uh, yeah, I think just, you know, get the agreements in place and bring people to the table. You know, if there's going to be a new system launch or a change in a system under our agreement, we're responsible for all technology. So when you walk into one of my offices, every single thing is owned by the company um, from Everything. The cameras, we, we have to lease from them, everything. So um, when IT was kind of deciding to change things up, that has happened three times in 15 years where a equipment purchase we just had was, they said, no, we're changing it and three months later. and But we're out the money. And we are a small business, so we don't have the purchasing pow power of DOA to make these big purchases. Um, so just to have, you know, even somebody... DMV's budget set, right? But then there's DOA. If there was somebody that was always constantly thinking about the business partnership group, so that if you don't want one of us at the table talking about implementation of processes or th things like that, constantly thinking, okay, if, we're, if we do this, how is it going to affect the business partners? Because it's all about the client experience. And so when we have, you know, five to 700 people a day choosing to come into my company, and we can't do something, they get very angry very quickly. Um, and then it also means they're going back over to a state office and those lines get long and you know, the cutoff time of 4.30, then that client can't be helped. Do yeah. you have any ideas, Marla, on what you'd like to see? Uh, so I would like to see some um, just just telling the story about what we are and what the business partners provide, because a lot of times I think that people are worried about um, how we're perceived by employees and the unions. We're not driving business out. So we are just providing a different way to do business. And so, you know, just because I don't have uh, people in the front, I might have more people in the back supporting the business partners. There's, you know, all the work that has to go with. They just do the front end. We do the back end, auditing, making sure that everything is done, accounting, all of that work. Um, so just because we are doing business partners, we're not trying to. to it becomes a big discussion, and so sometimes people don't think about that. And when they make changes, just think about business partners. Uh, when when Krista started, you know, we they called them data processing. Yeah. And so I'm very big into just forcing it into, it's a business partner. Whether it's a driving school, it's a business partner. If it's a, if it's a retail location, it's a mm -hmm. business partner. If it's uh, a dealer, and we have 450 dealers, and a lot of them do their own pro you know, trying to get them to do their process, that's a business partner. That's not somebody taking from my employees, you know, and, and dispersing other ways. Yeah. It's all just a business. So using the right numbers. So I have a final question. I'm going to ask it once, but it's for both of you. So let, it, let, us, let us have it. Share your wisdom. How would you leverage technology, data, or digital services between UMV and the state to make the whole business partnership work better, flow smoother? What would you do to improve the partnership? I'm going to let, I'm going to let Chris to go first. Just so I can hear what she wants. <laughs> well, how long do you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, mercy. 
<laughs> okay. Um, I would, I would like to, you know, we, we live in a world of technology and people like think fast and quick and right now in real time. And so we have um, people opt in, so we'll send out text messages 90, 60, and 30 days before um, whatever you need renewed is renewed as a reminder. But if our programmers had access to the back end systems, people could just click on the link that's in the text message and walk through the steps so, so that uh, the new registration card and tab was mailed out to whatever is on record at that time. So it would be simple click, enter your you know credit card information, go on about your day, and we're mailing it. And then to have that also available on our own website. That's my big want. <laughs> Um, so um, on my side, I would say uh, having more of, like, I would love to see a DMV app and more services provided to the customers. Uh, the, the way that the DMVs are, uh, the industry is going is to provide mobile IDs so you can have it on your phone. Um, you know, it's got a ways to go, but there are, there are states that are now deploying this. Uh, you know, now, and then we have to wait for businesses to catch up a little bit. So when you go to the Costco, you would just show your phone and it would have your ID on it. So um, being able to provide different services in an app, um, could we bring in other things for the DMV? Could we bring in vital statistics to get your birth certificate copies, things like that? So I, I love the idea of the data hubbing and, and sharing of the data because there's so many other ideas that can be done. Thinking, thinking outside of the box. So, okay, so I, it prompts me for another question. I hope you don't mind. Um, so, if, who else would you partner with? Who else? Yeah. Would you partner with a different kind of private industry? Would you, if you're going to expand the service, would you partner with more state agencies? Who would you partner with next? If you, this is your crystal ball for both of you, who would you partner with next? Well, I want to partner with the Department of Fish and Game. If you're coming into my office to get your boat registered and or titled based on the new law, FYI everybody, <laughs> it did pass, um, <laughs> then and that makes the perfect you know, time, right? Mm -hmm. To make sure, hey, you're going out on the water, I'd like to be able to issue you your, um, your fishing license right then and there. And you know, same for in the, the boat launch, fees, right, or to be able to um, do the park passes for, you know, if we, when we see people coming in and they have trailers that they're registering and their ATVs of whatever kind, most likely they're going to be out on state land, which means they're going to have to have that pass. So things like that. We want to partner with all of you, everybody. I One stop shop. Game is next. So I know. I'm very excited about that. <laughs> um, well, who would I... Well, um, you know, it's funny because we were just slamming ideas to this morning about who else could, who could be doing business. There, there really is a lot of places that could be doing it. Dealerships, um, and, you know, when you buy a new car, yeah. they're sending that work to the DMV to be done. And then we're processing it and then sending it to them and then they're sending it to you. Mm -hmm. So having them do their work is really where we're pushing um, and giving it more access that way. I think that there are a ton of businesses that align with the DMV. I believe that, that not all companies are going to be like Krista and Melissa at UMV because they don't, you have to have another, another gig, right? What's your real business? Insurance companies. I think insurance companies would be a great way to jump in. They insure the cars. They, you, know, you have to show your registration when you're getting your insurance, and it's a nice fit. But, you know, it's not, it, they have to have their own client base to be able to bring something in to add on. So when you're thinking about different things. <laughs> Great. Any last minute thoughts you want to share before we move to the fishing game? Um, well, just as, you know, you're talking about the private sector government relationship and collaboration, um, just, just know I do, my company, we're job creators. We created jobs where they're were none in areas and locations where there were no DMV. And so we are helping to improve state efficiencies be by, efficiencies by being open longer hours so people aren't having to take time off of work. They can go on their lunch break or on their weekends. So 
Um, we're helping to keep the economy going, things like that. And we have the flexibility as a private company to give back to where we live, whether it's our employees, sports teams, or performing arts endeavors, um, to organizations like My House, which is an amazing uh, homeless youth. I, I love them. We're very involved with My House. Um, their kids from around the state, youth from around the state, go there and they're provided with job skills training, uh, life coaching, um, safe housing, that kind of thing. And then also Set Free Alaska, again, around the state, helps people overcome um, addiction. We have an awesome children's program. But as a private company, we can give our dollars back. The state doesn't, you know, Marla, she would, I'm sure she would like to, but she has no control over that budget, right? So. Just remember that. All right. So let's give a big warm welcome. After Fishing Game, because we really want to have our question and answer session with both panels. So um, next, what I'd like to do is introduce the Department of Fishing Game panel. Heather, is it three or four? We have three. 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 We have two. Okay. All right. Good. Come up now. I just got to come on up. I just got to make sure I have enough chairs. I don't want everybody to have to stand all the time. So um, we're going to introduce the <coughs> Department of Fish and Game eVendor Solutions panelist. Tom Fletcher is, <coughs> excuse me, is the Department Technology Officer for the Department of Fish and Game. Thomas has been a project manager with the Department of Fish and Game for the past six years. He helped lead the My ADFG License Modernization Project. And before working for Fish and Game, Thomas consulted for a variety of agencies at the state and was previously a fisheries manager and data analyst for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Please help me welcome Thomas Fletcher to our panel. And next, I'd like to introduce the community partner, James Boss from Alaska Fishtopia. James grew up in Kenai, Alaska, before moving to Montana for college, where he pursued electrical engineering and computer science degrees. After graduating, James spent 10 years with Hewlett Packard. In 2003, he went to work for Pelco Inc. as the director of marketing and engineering and from 2010 to 2017, he led the Americas for a globally expanding company called UDP, Inc. It was focused on intelligent analytics and video security cameras. I have a teenage son. I may need to talk to him. <laughs> you don't want to know what they're doing. <laughs> Excuse me. In 20 James began work on Alaska Fish Tokyo, which launched in the summer of 2018 on both iOS and Android. Alaska Fish Topia is an informational technology app for Alaska outdoor enthusiasts and summertime visitors. Fish Topia takes a wide variety of both public and <coughs> proprietary information and makes it available and easy to use in mobile application. Please help me welcome James Boss. So many thanks to both of you for coming up and being part of a panel. I don't know about you if you've ever been on a panel, but a panel is an interesting experience because you don't have that presentation, but you gotta have everything ready because you never know what's gonna come from the question. So thank you for being willing to do that. Um, so I'm going to start with a question for Thomas, have him give a quick overview of um, what's happening with Fishing Game, and then we're going to move to James with Fishtopia. You ready? Sounds good. All right. Okay, so Thomas, tell us, why did Fishing Game decide to change the format of their partnership program to an e-commerce program? Hmm, good question. My presentation's been changing since I... Been listening to everybody, but um, <laughs> first of all, you're welcome to sell some licenses. I 
but it was not integrated with the rest of your stuff. But we we'll can't work, do. We'll work on. Okay. We'll work on. We can do licenses, but we can't do uh, launch permits, park permits, or registration. So, in terms of, we'll talk about it later. Yeah. Um, okay. So, fishing game has had a um, vendor system for years, since the 80s, I think, maybe late 70s. And all that means is that uh, stores, mostly outdoor stores, can sell um, fishing hunting licenses at their location. And it's a matter of convenience. It's the folks who, when they're out in the field, can go get what they need to get to legally hunt a fish. Uh, a lot of paper, hundreds of thousands of licenses, lots of data in boxes, um, lots of uh, gear tags and fishing permits and um, hunting and fishing licenses in different boxes that we could never really tell what the what activity was. So in 2013, we got somebody from the legislature, thank you for, for that, for the state of Alaska, to modernize all our systems. And one of the tools we built was um, a system where you, you can have a computer or a laptop at Fred Myers or Western Auto and a driver's license scanner and you can scan someone's driver's license and the information gets repopulated. It takes about two minutes to sell a license. Um, that, that's sort of where we went with that project. We've been pushing our large vendors to go because they have lots of staff and they have Nike staff and they have equipment. So when you get to the office, the question will talk about the people who don't have equipment. <laughs> All right. That's fair. Yes. Guess what? You, you've you already seen the crystal ball. <laughs> okay, here's the next question. What obstacles are you facing? Uh, well, there's two I would talk about. Tim's going to have more, I think, than me. Um, one is adoption. Uh, we've done really well in large stores. Fred Meyer, Sportsman's Warehouse, Western Auto. Uh, Less, so folks that have brick and mortar presence. Um, charter industry, not so much. Their model is go pick some of cruise ships, put them in a van, hand out booklets of paper and have them fill it in like a ticket, like an old time ticket to the movie theater. And um, those folks, if they don't have internet or maybe they have not had, maybe not. And it's just not really, <coughs> this model isn't really working for them. So we have to kind of get over that. The second obstacle is weirder, um, and that's that for whatever reason, the more electronic we go, because we have a store to an online store, uh, it seems like the more support we need, the more phone support we need, and we're not quite sure what that's about. We just opened up Chitna and Anchorage and Glen Allen, and there was lines out the door, and we're not quite sure why people feel like they need to come to us to get an explanation when all the stuff's online. Not quite sure. That's a great question. That's, so that you got my brain thinking now. Because mm -hmm. I, I would imagine we would see that in more than one area. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break the rules of engagement <coughs> um, and go below the engagement level, right? Okay, so Marla, do you get a lot of support questions? A ton. A ton. Well, for, from the business partners or from the customer? From the customer. From the customer, from the customer APOC. Okay. So we had, we've actually in the last couple of years I created a call, uh, you know, a call queue. And so now we have the way to, to gather the data of how many people are calling in. Because we used to call in at all the offices, each had a phone that was ringing off the hook while they had customers in front of them. So now everything comes into Anchorage or you know and we and we um, route the questions there. But the calls are increasing. I kind of have a reason for mine. Real ID is increasing. But, um, I will walk you all through your documents needed. <laughs> <laughs> I will check them all for you. But, uh, but yes, yeah, so we do have more calls, the more we do online, the more questions. For some reason, they'll call with an order before they will do it online. And then we always have cash. And do you see that happening too, Thomas? It just depends on the product and I have to say the demographic. Okay. So what has been the internal impact? You mentioned more calls. What else has happened inside Fish and Game with adoption of this e-commerce platform? 
efficiency, overhead? What what's the impact? Uh, definitely some efficiencies and definitely some overhead. Um, we're really distributed department, and fisheries biologists in Yakutat feels like they that is their domain. They run that fishery. They were, are in charge of that permit. Um, so kind of consolidating all that manage not the management, but the permitting itself and the harvest reporting into one place um, has been a big change for folks, good and bad. Um, and do you yeah. see a difference between fishing and hunting? Yes. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> <laughs> hunting is complicated. So, you know, one of the things our tool does is that um, for our area offices, is that the business rules are baked into it. So you can walk in. And if you don't know a lot about a product like Fitna, you can walk through the screens and um, issue some of the permits. It's not a big deal. It used to be just for fish folks with that. Hunting is harder because some of the hunts are uh, multi-layered, put it polite. So you actually might need uh, an expert to come back from behind the, from an office and explain to you how to do that legally. So that that's the struggle. So now think about where you want to be 10 years from now. Where do you want to go? Where do you want to see the e-commerce program going? This is a good, good segue for Jim. That we are going more electronic, more mobile. Uh, everyone wants to be able to show their phone in the field to the troopers and have everything they need be on that phone and not get rid of the ticket, which is partly what I think some of the calls are that we are in between. We can do some stuff on the phone, not all of it right now. Um, I see it's providing lots of endpoints so that app developers like Jim can um, go build their own version of what a hunting or fishing app would be like for instead of last night. Okay, thank you for sharing. So Jim, walk us through it. How did you start? How did you get introduced to the partnership? And where are you today? So, in t like we like in the introduction you provided in 2017, I've been so you know I left Alaska. I came back with my two little girls in like 2012, and they'd caught this little fish in California. And they're like, "This is the greatest day of my life." I'm like, "You should see where I went to high school," <laughs> you know. And I actually, I actually chose to to take them to Alaska. I said, "We're going to take you to Alaska this summer," and so brought them up here, but you know, I actually searched around for a good bit because I wasn't going to just try to take them where I grew up. If we're going to take a trip to Alaska where I hadn't been since 1988, let's go to the best place in Alaska that there poss possibly could be to take these two fish in. It turns out it's like right where I went to high school. So we, we went back there. That's kind of controversial. It could be. I agree. <laughs> I, there are some places I really want to. I really want to go to that I've never had a chance, but that's where we ended up going, and, and they had a great time. I put them in a tent for eight weeks. And when we finished it, they were like, can we come back next year? And then after that, they said, can we come back every year? I'm like, absolutely. So as we started, you know, doing more and more and more of this, I got, you know, more into the area. And as you started looking around at all the information that we try to use when we're fishing, we want tides and currents. And we want to know the fish counts. And we want to know the weather and the marine weather. You know, just all this stuff. And none of, it's mobile friend none of it is mobile friendly. Um, even NOAA will tell you right there, if you go to their website and try to get title information, they'll say, we don't have an app for you. We don't even want to build an app for you. Other people will do that. We'll give you the data. So I just went to try to, to take all of the information that we, we try to get and use to go on a successful day and make it mobile friendly and put it in my pocket. And that's what got us started. So. Who talked to whom first? How did it start between you and Fish and Game? It started with us reaching out to Fish and Game because we needed a way to, uh, first, the first thing we needed from Fish and Game was the fish counts. Mm -hmm. And so they're available on the website. And we can try this technique in the tech field called scraping, where we go and we just pull the web page like yours and I's eyes would read it. But any small changes to that kind of defeats any of the algorithms that would parse it. It breaks really easily. So we, we started heading down that route and eventually reached the right folks and said we'd really like to do fish counts. And then they showed us how to get into the database. And it still took some wrangling on our part to make it all work right. 
because we don't, for example, we don't get notifications from Fish and Game that things have been updated. What we do is our app, a server part of our app, pings the Fish and Game's data servers from about 8 o'clock in the morning till about noon every day on about 10 minute intervals, so we're not banging on it real hard, right? And we look for new data that's been added, and then we grab it and we present mm -hmm. it in our app. But what would be best is if we were simply notified that the new data was in there rather than this polling routine, which is just not very efficient for anybody. But the fish, the fish counts were the first things that we needed. But our app interfaces a lot to fishing game. We have sport fishing regulations loaded in it. So there's always an electronic sport reg in your pocket if you want it. We do the fish counts. We do news and fishing reports. We repurpose those into the app so that they're available to anybody that wants that. We repurpose emergency orders. And a lot of that's done by hand. And we subscribe to all of the emails that Fish and Game sends to all of the regions and all that sort of stuff. And then the app actually um, allows you to segment and to say, I'm an interior person, I'm a South Central, I'm a Southeast. And as those things get repurposed, because we'll just grab the email and do a cut and paste job into our server that knows how to then disseminate it all. And it, it looks good and it's mobile and it's in your pocket and it's formatted for that type of device. But it's a manual process at the moment. And you're doing fresh and salt water. Both. Yep. So um, describe for us the obstacles that you've run into. What are some of the obstacles that you think are really pertinent that we should know about? We don't have, we don't have a lot. Mm -hmm. The ones that we do encounter are the ones where what fish and game would even like to do are kind of limited by the regulations. There's an element where, state, where the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, this has been an educational on my part, so I'm certainly not an expert on how it all works, but they're not in control of everything. They don't get to set all the policy. They get to set some of it, but some of it's set legislatively, right? One of those, and, and I won't take any offense if somebody says, no, that's not right, but one of the ones we believe we're aware of is, is it says that the, the sport fishing license has to be signed in. Okay, so there's, that's, a, that's Alaska law, and the Fish and Games point at that point has to police that, and there's nothing they can do. So, when we show up and say, we would love to be a part of eVendor and make it so that in your pocket, and I'll give you an example about why this can be important in a minute, is, um, is we want to be an eVendor and just purchase it right, in your, you know, right from the phone and it's ready to go. Well, we can't do that if the law says it has to be signed in ink. Now, in our app, we have an area that you can store your license because it does say that now that, that some of the, I forget the name of the, the legislator that's been pushing through this stuff to get some of that changed, but they've approved the idea that you can show a digital copy of your sport fishing license, but it still has to be signed. So you can store that, your picture of that in your device, but it doesn't fix the harvest cards, right? And there's things that have to be logged, right? But some of this is really important because we want visitors in the state to continue to come back and have a great experience. And what will happen is they'll show up for a charter down at the Nilchik one day, and they'll say, we need to see your licenses at 5 a.m. And they say, we don't have one. Okay, well, your day's done because we're going to miss the tide, we're going to miss your trip, and you can't, we can't put you on the boat without a sport fishing license. And that happens actually quite frequently down there, particularly for foreign visitors, you know, the ones that don't really understand English that well or can't understand our, our laws and regulations that well for the sport fishing. So all of a sudden we're turning people away, and they're having a bad experience. So the, uh, for the rest of it, in terms of accessing the data and things like that, we've had great support from um, Lisa Holt and from Tom and everybody up there with everything we're doing. And the only time that we end up with any problems is when what we want to do kind of interferes with some of the legislative stuff that's around. So this is a question for both of you. What else would you like? What other data would you like to get from each other? You want to go first? Sure. So one of the things that we're offering in our app is people are continually confused by what's legal and what's not. In general, I have to say, look, people don't, they're not interested in breaking the law most of the time. They just want to have a good fishing experience. And with the emergency orders that come out and the different things, they, the technique, what do they call it, um, methods and means, right? Mm -hmm. They're confused about what those are and what those look like, and particularly what they are right now where they're standing or where they're going to go. So we're working on elements of our app where, because it has GPS information in it, they can find out where they're at and be able to be told, today you can catch three sockeye on the Russian River where you're standing, and, 
and you know what those things kind of look like. And those regulations are really difficult to, to read, even for, a, for me that I've been trying to get through them, to put them into our app and stuff like that. They're, they're tough to figure out. So simplifying those sorts of things, and, and particularly in a format where it can be stored in a database and retrieved, and then things are touched without the manual processes that we go through. And to give you an example of what some of those look like, it's, it's different, but in many ways very similar. It's just the, tech, the need that we have for the digital side hasn't kept up with the state of things. So if you were to go look at what the commercial fishery rules look like right now, and even just the regions where they're defined, from shell platform C to a rock that's located over here to something that's over there, and I can't sort it out, and I'm trying real hard to sort it out. And so just we need that type of information like that's been intentionally stored digitally for retrieval and use kinds of stuff, because right now it's still textual descriptions, and they're really, really local. And what would you like to see, Tom? Well, I completely agree with all that. I, I guess I'd like to see us be more nimble, more able to respond. And um, one of the things we've been thinking about is we have this e-vendor tool where we're sending out information to vendors and updates and stuff like that. We don't get a lot back. Like if we were a proper sales channel or if we were at the head of the sales channel, we would be getting back like, oh, hey, look, no one's understanding this permit right now. You guys need to clarify this for each person because we're not, I mean, we get from like eight vendors. Like this is whether they're mobile vendors or brick and mortar, this isn't working. That would be great. We haven't built that yet. That would be, that would be pretty high now. But. So I have this vision now that this phone, oh, which I have the light on. Sorry, I don't mean to blind you. Aha, there we go. So on this phone, I'm going to have my driver's license. And right next to it, I'm going to have my fishing license. And I'll be able to see all of my title information and all the regs right here. That's kind of the vision that I'm hearing that could be possible in the next couple of years. So this, I, I like that. That's nice, right? Because this, as you've seen today, it hardly ever goes very far away from you. How many of you are more than two feet away from your phone right now? I start to shake when I get further away from <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. I'll okay. tell you, one of the challenges that we're, that we're all going to see in that sort of, as you get into building these mobile apps, is what we go through right now, is that there are so many different handsets, so many different versions of the operating system. Yeah. They're constantly changing. We were just talking a moment ago about how uh, we consume uh, Google Maps. It's when you go into our, our app and you go try to figure out where the tides and the currents are, we have all these pins that show up to show you where you can go look at the like the local tide, and there's a lot of mapping going on in our app. Google just decided uh, about six months ago that they're now going to charge for that, and they just shut everybody's keys off. And we had to go back, and they will not give it to you without putting a credit card on file. And this is, was really difficult, too, because they basically said, we're going to charge you for your consumption rate, and we don't know what that's ever going to look like. So we have no idea. I mean, they tell us what the rate is, but we don't know what the consumption is going to look like. So if all of a sudden I've got a million users that I don't charge very much for, they're all pulling down apps, and then Google comes up and says, well, that was great. You now owe us $1,000 for the month. That's going to break me. But th th I guess the point was the mobile market of phones and tablets and all that is so spread out with versions of the operating systems, the technology that's being used, that staying on top of it is a massive job. Yeah, and I follow up on that. That's a good question for um, Marla, too. You know, we feel like we owe the Alaska public, or the folks that come to hunt this year, something basic that can use feel. Where does that responsibility end and our responsibility to provide the endpoints and the data to someone like you who's going to build something that's probably more elaborate than we're going to be able to launch? You know, we're probably not going to have tight and current information if we build it. But those kind of questions, we haven't really looked at it. I don't know if you have. Well, and where my brain goes is, and what if you were partnering not only with Fish and Game, but with DNR and DEC and DOT to get um, information about where are their eagle nests, where are their fish colors, where are their, I mean, there's so many pieces of information you could call from the state that's not confidential. 
that could help you build an even bigger, um, more robust experience that may not involve something like Google or something like that. And you didn't ask the question, but there's a, there's so much to take on right now that I think the, the way to approach it is you got to look at it like eating the elephant. Yeah. You just got to take it one bite at a time and figure out which is the most important bite to take right now and take a step forward in that one thing. And just over time, you know, you'll make the progress, but it's going to be a long, a long process. So who else would you all partner with? How would you expand this in terms of building partnerships? Where would you like to go next? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll be quick. Well, I like your idea. I like the idea of um, someone's going to go on a trip. What are some things? Where are they going to stay? You know, what kind of vehicle are they going to use? Do they need a boat? Launch permit, which is usually at least on the you know, city thing. You know, much more holistic. Uh, you know, we could be a partner in a trip uh, planning app. I love that idea. And for me, I'm I'm approaching this from a very capitalistic point of view. I really appreciated what you said earlier about putting everything you own into a company and watching it sort of disappear. And the amount of investment that I have in this app is pretty enormous. Mm -hmm. And the you know we charge two bucks a year for it. So we need a lot of users to make this thing work, or we have to find other ways to pull in money. So. Well, everything I'm working on right now is to try to figure out how to make the app lucrative enough that we can continue with it. And so we have a huge, we have a massive giveaway starting here probably today or tomorrow. We're probably giving away $100,000 worth of prizes and gifts between now and the end of the summer. Typically it's like four prizes a day. It's an upgrade into our premium version of our app, for example. So for an extra 10 bucks, okay, we're trying to make money. For an extra 10 bucks, we've got these very generous businesses that have offered to support us, Simon and Seifert's in Anchorage. Uh, I don't know who we have here in, in Juneau, but um, if you upgrade in our app for $10, they're going to give you a free appetizer every time you come into their restaurant. And we have lots of people kind of giving us these sorts of things. So every day we're going to upgrade somebody for free to this Prime membership. We're going to give away a lure. We're giving away fishing trips, halibut trips. Um, a really beautiful commemorative knife set. So everything I'm working on right now is trying to figure out how do I get just users on this system. And once we get there, then we'll tell them, well, then we can start asking the questions, what do you want to see next? Mm -hmm. But right now, it's just all about trying to make it survive. People that, the problem that we have is people love it when they see it. But when you ask somebody, else, who in here has heard of Alaska fish topia before today? Yeah, so that's the, this is the <laughs> issue that we have. And when people see it, yeah. Well, the thing is, here's something fun for uh, we try. Well, one of the things we're trying to do is, yeah, it's called Fishtopia. Why? Because I couldn't think of anything better at the time. <laughs> and, but it, it does go beyond that. And if for any of us that have spent time in some of the larger cities, they often have these publications that will say, "Here's what you're doing this month all across our city." What do you find here? Well, we've created one. So there's an, an element in our app called events and entertainment where we have thousands and thousands of things that you can go do. And we've tried to be very careful about it. We don't want your open mic nights and the farmer's market down the street that happens every week. What we're trying to do is just focus in on the really, what I'm calling high production value events. Okay, things that have a lot of investment in them and things that people would want to go see whether they live here or just visiting. And we're doing these sorts of things because we need to try to figure out how to get this app to make money out and have people care about it that don't fish, especially outside of the three-month fishing season of the year. Great. Let's do a warm, a warm thank you. We'll add a chair. Are we staying? Yes, we're staying. Okay, so what we're going to do now is the whole panel, both panels are open for any questions you have. Yeah, I was curious on some of the, the smartphone application stuff. Uh, the And then also just uh, not everybody has a smartphone or how do you how do you combine for the government side, how do you combine that access for for people not needing to 
have a phone for, for some of the services? Ooh, good question. Um, the out-of-service question is something that other states are tackling, specifically in the Rocky Mountain hunting, big hunting states, big game hunting states. And basically, uh, you, well, you'd know more, you're the app developer, but you know, you can record your harvest offline and when you hit a cell phone tower, it gets loaded up and you, you can, you know, you're basically taking a picture of the animal and you can show that to enforcement to prove that you've recorded that catch. Um, in terms of the access for folks that um, aren't going to have a phone, that's a good question. I mean, we would like to get away from paper, but I think there's some circumstances where we're always going to have it. Yeah. And there was another question there, too, I think. I, I missed it. Water. Water. Well, that's an issue. That's, we didn't really talk about enforcement, but that's sort of something we've talked about a lot. They're one of our partners, and what are they going to be okay with out in the field? I mean, if you drop your phone, I, I can't speak for the troopers, but that might be something that they're going to allow once, because people lose their licenses, all, their paper licenses all the time too. Um, but how are they going to track people that are taking advantage of that leniency? Yeah, I guess also if the battery died. Or... Yeah. yeah. Extra batteries. Okay, and so to make sure that everybody can hear, um, Heather's going to come around. Raise your hand with your question. She's going to text it to me so I can speak it into the um, speaker. So everybody with questions, go ahead and put your hands up, and we'll start sending them forward. Here comes Smith. Yeah. Um. Just let Heather know what it is. So, um, villages, we hear a lot of times that people want random information about distance openers. So I'm wondering if there's a way to use technology like PlayStation Video or something new at Fish and Game to be able to push out more information about distance openers compared to the villages. Okay, so the question is, is there a way for us to push real-time subsistence information out to the villages? when there's an opening? I think that's something an app could do. I think it depends on what technology folks are using out there. Um, you know, I know in one region, for whatever reason, Facebook is the technology. And so, um, just so like a side story, we were very, in my opinion, uptight about having lots of Facebook groups and kind of <coughs> you know, an unmanaged Facebook presence. But this one group of constituents, I think in the Yukon, if I'm not mistaken, were like, this is, this is how we do it. This is how we talk and, and figure out what's going on. So we finally overcame that, and the regional managers, and that, that's how they communicate. So I, I think just being open to the tools, whatever the tools are that people are using, is the way to go. It is, yeah. We're adding a few elements of the side to it, but it's mostly the, the information that the sport people would like to know about the commercial fishery, which is, are those nets out today? <laughs> but, you know, and, talk, you know, and I never really intended to sit down this path with Fishtopia until we started talking more closely with Fish and Game and started looking at making the app provide um, the ability to purchase licenses. Once you start thinking about that, and you start interfacing to eVendor, you say, well, geez, my app can purchase all of the licenses, the combos and all that kind of stuff. That starts you thinking again about now, how do we go from Fishtopia to whatever, you know, it's going to be called where it supports the hunting side of it and all that and just starts to branch out a little more. Question for the business owner. When I hear your stories, I really can see why people would say smaller government. Um, how are you interacting with uh, not government but actually legislators that are either looking at passing or have passed things that interfere with you being successful? Uh, how are you interacting with them to get that kind of stuff changed and also bringing their awareness of their role and influence of business and not just thinking governmental role? That's a great question. 
um, advice I was given very early on, right after I actually graduated from college, was get into politics or get out of business. Um, if you don't know who the lawmakers are or the chief of staff, if you're not out there kind of, you know, talking about what you do um, and fostering relationships at the human level, not with the letter behind names, but in conversations, it can be very challenging. Um, and so we work really, really hard. Um, at doing that, but you also you talked about packaging. Um, when you know Marla mentioned that the business partnerships account for what it what was it last year? It was like 30 million of the 80 million that DMV delivered to the general fund, and so my firm is by far the largest of that 30 million. Uh, depending on the year, um, it's you know anywhere between like eight to 10 million that really um, we we just deliver right. Every single day, we are transferring money from five different locations to to DMV. So it's saying things like that. Um, Marley, you had 150 people in 18 offices. Mm -hmm. I have 26 and five. So saying things like that, reminding them that that's all on our dime, right? The, the payroll, the retirement, the paid time off. Talking, just letting people know that all we're doing is we're simply providing a choice. Citizens. Can choose to come to us or not. Yes, the state gets 100% of their money. We ha we charge a customer service fee. That's it. It's a very tiny portion that we get to keep of the money that is brought in. Um, but really, it's, it's about relationships. That's all it is, about showing up to things like this, being invited, you know, traveling around, coming down to Juno, that kind of thing. Because uh, sometimes it is definitely pushing a boulder up a mountain. And for me, aside from the one issue of one, us wanting to be able to get licenses purchased easily through a mobile app in your pocket, we haven't had any legislative type issues that we've had to be concerned with yet. And one thing I would say, um, have I, yeah. I think you what thing? Well, the problem is that the mic can't no, pick you up. No, you repeat it. I want you. Oh, if I repeat. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Well, before we do that, we've got one question in the queue, and then we'll get to your question. One thing I would say is that when we look at our customers, whether we are private sector, nonprofit, or government, public sector, our customers' expectations are radically different from what they were 10 years ago. They're radically different from what they were even five years ago. Our customers expect a lot more service for a lot less uh, because, because they, you know, if you think about it, think about all the things we get from our phone. We're used to thinking, oh, I'm going to try that game. <laughs> like it? Don't like it? Delete it? Go get another one? And if that, it's a very different customer expectation. And so partnerships, like the ones we talked about through the panel, help all of us meet our customers' expectations. Because the bottom line is, we all serve our customers. Could I add something to Absolutely. the question over here about the legislative part of it and the obstacles? I don't think, the, for me, it, I don't, it might not be true for you, but for me, there's bigger obstacles in the personalities that are hired and whether they support these sorts of initiatives or they don't versus the legislative part of it. So if you had mentioned prior to you know, yeah. this that it was very difficult to work and it's the hiring and the personalities that are running the organizations are probably more important, I think, than the legislative part of it alone. If they're trying to empire build or I'm trying to build a big staff, and those are more important than the things that they're doing. And we all know that there are managers out there in the world that do those sorts of things. They can put up far bigger obstacles, I think, than the legislative part of it, or equally, equally anyway. And that's a perfect lead into our next question, which is, when you're, and this is for all four of you, when you're going to start a collaboration, how do you ensure performance, either from the state or from contractor, the private business. So for the DMV, we put um, auditing requirements and quality assurance uh, in the contract. 
So if if we don't get you know deposits on time or we don't get the you know you talk about paperwork, we have you know 1.5 million transactions creates a lot of paper. So they have to bring in everything on time, and we and then we go through and look at you know, transactions. So we we built that in. Uh, I, I believe that we have to be very uh, cognizant of making sure that the people, we, we background check everybody. You know, we have to make sure that everybody that touches the data that we've been entrusted with is is not, you know, doing something bad with it. So we're very big in the audit. audit. No, okay. No, yeah. okay. Um, I, I'd say for us, we're in contact with our front counter staff and with uh, private vendors out in the field. And our feedback loop is almost instant. If we change something on our page or on the e-vendor product, uh, you know, we move a button over or change the color of something, we, and people don't like it, we hear about it really quick. <laughs> um, less often when it goes well, but. Um, and we try to be really uh, aware of that, and it, and I don't really know of a better way to do it. Other, it, you know, I mean, how many versions of your app have you had so far? I mean, but without just kind of trying things and and seeing how it works and some for some of the usability stuff. You know. Yeah, it's been hard for us too because we, you know, on the the biggest issue that we've had as we've launched this app has been converging both the Android side and the Apple side. Some learnings that we had is in Alaska, 90% of the people seem to be using iPhones. And I, Apple in general is incredibly difficult to work with. They're, they're, they behave as your own, as their own quality department. They'll, they'll say something like, I don't like the way that works, and they just won't let you put it out. And so Android, on the other hand, you just release it and it's off the go. But we went through 63 iterations once to get a to get it approved through Apple, and they'll look at it and go, "Well, I saw this thing and it didn't look like it was behaving right, so I'm not letting it out into the store." They do it. They just put a, a, a ton of obstacles. Right now, our code base runs. It's one piece of code that runs on both Apple and Android, but that's pretty unique. And it's it's we can do it because we're primarily this informational app. If we were trying to be a game or something, we would have to like build natively for Android and natively for the iOS. We're fortunate in, in that regard. Keeps the code base size down and man, when we fix one bug, we're not chasing it somewhere else or whatever the case may be. But the biggest challenge is we've seen there in sort of keeping things rolling is just, if I, so we've made new updates in, um, to the app that aren't released yet to the public, right? Every time it happens, I'm gonna lose. I can spend 10 days trying to get it through Apple. That's intense. It's tough. <laughs> um, for us, we at UMV, we have our own internal um, standards that are in place. You know, number one, you're looking to hire people that are of the highest integrity because of what they are accessing. Um, we contract services does review, audit our work. We also have our own auditing procedures that are in place. Um, so you audit your own work, and a team member audits it, and a manager also, you know, checks it. So if we do our job wrong, I wouldn't have a company because people wouldn't constantly come back to us if we were screwing up their stuff because you get a nasty gram letter from the state of Alaska saying, on this day, this transaction was done incorrectly and you have a stop on your record or your driver's license is being recalled or, you know, something like that. So in order to even exist, we have to do it correctly. And you now that's our goal. We're mission driven and integrity is that that's the only thing that we have. Can, can I add something in here? Mm -hmm. Keep coming back to your question. So good. I every time I, I turn know. around, I somebody else has like, said something. Like, oh, I have something else. So speaking of like obstacles and working with the organizations, one of the things that that I, the way I view what we've built is we are helping the Alaska Department of Fish and Game speak to their customers, right? We're, we're helping. And yet nobody in here sort of knew about this app. And most of the people in the state don't know about the app. Time and time again for help. Help us get the word out. We're even supporting the Alaska Department of Fish and Game uh, hashtags. So there's a section of the app where we encourage participation. Go show you out there being Alaska awesome pictures of you on a glacier catching fish or whatever you're doing, right? And every time they do that and they post it, it shows up on our social media pages. 
goes straight from the app to Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all that with the hashtag WeFishAK, which is Alaska Department of Fishing Games hashtag. But I've said, I've asked time and time again, could somebody help me get the word out? You've got all these customers that you've been talking to for decades now, right? Help get the word out about my app. Just let them know, here's a source that you can go get found a champion inside the company that will say, or inside the fishing game, that will say, I'll help you. What they say is, well, we got to be careful that we're playing fair. Well, I get that too, but I'm the only guy. So you are you are playing fair. <laughs> so th that's what, it, I guess that's kind of a highlight towards the personalities that's in the job as the management and the manager that was hired to kind of run the department or run whatever they, somebody within the Alaska Department of Fish and Game can stand up and say, I'd love to help you and I'm going to get the word out about your app, but nobody is. Because there is no rules that's saying they can't, right? No one's going to be able to point to this little thing and says, it says right here, I can't help you. As long as it's not an ethics violation. Right, and it's that's not. There are none of those sorts of things, and yet I haven't found the champion that will help, you know, sort of help me get the word out. Just first, you have a question. Yeah, so when you said mobile friends with different operating systems, is there, is there um, guidance that the people post these data? Does that boil down to six or eight things uh, with the format of the data that we publish? Make it mobile friendly or much more complicated than that? Much less? No, it's not that complicated. It just it has to be built in a form that it can be sort of like expanded over time because you're going to do it and you're going to create it in a form where you just kind of put some stuff in a file database that can be accessed and retrieved through what we would call JSON or some type of interface, right? But then you're going to wake up one day and go, well, we should have added this to it because we didn't know any better. At the time. And it needs to be extensible into that. But once the data is there, writing them on the mobile part of it to access and pull stuff out of it is actually quite simple. And then you're just presenting it in a different way. Yeah. A lot of our news releases are PDFs right now, so yeah. we could we could be much more friendly than that. I mean, going back to the subsistence question, if those uh, news were in a format you could grab, you could absolutely bring them into your app, yeah. no problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you say that, I assume you mean an Excel table, as simple as that, instead of just a PDF attachment in Excel. It would be a version of a database that is, in some ways, in, in our minds, we think about it as an Excel spreadsheet. It's rows and columns of data, but it's stored in more of a computer format. And it sounds like you also need like shape files with GeoJSON when it's saying from this rock. That's right. You actually. Yeah, and so what I'm planning to do is, once we release this version, we've we've got like seven zones that are going to be our first zone. Tiptoeing into what you know, kind of taking my own medicine of what I said. You start and then see how well it works before I take on a bigger piece. So we've got like eight zones around the Kenai and Kasilov rivers because they're because I could get the shape files and those are important areas that a lot of people care about. So we're going to go get those working. Then what we'll do is send out a notice to our customers and go, okay, we did seven or eight of them. Which ones would you guys like to see next? And what I'm likely to do at that point is go pull out that big commercial uh, you know, description of what the commercial fishery looks like for that particular zone that they asked about and I'm going to painstakingly go create the file myself and put it out there because if I, I, I have gotten good support, there's the chance that I could request that type of file that you just said and have somebody respond, but I'm not going to count on it. Um, yeah, I also I really like your example because you're kind of translating from uh, more of an enterprise system, which is, you know, you're not running an enterprise like in DMV, it's not quite as Realm, but you're, you've got lots of like small, any one of those could be considered <clears throat> maybe small or like not that important just to somebody in the state. But when you add them all up, you've got an app yeah. that's hopefully going to scale. And, and I feel like that speaks a lot to some of the projects that I work on where like I'm asking DMV for how many electric vehicles have been registered in SIPCA or something like that to help them with planning mm -hmm. for electric vehicle infrastructure, electricity issues. But, you know, it's not mission critical to some project to get that yeah. information. But when you start creating that culture of having data accessible in the format that feeds into a computer, 
um, and, and it, it is a lot of personality driven. I mean, I just, that example of TMB, like a lot of times, <laughs> I, I don't call the right person. I don't get. <laughs> in my email box. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think we can do some things like that. I this is the part that excites me is like I love the idea of being Alaska awesome and doing all these really cool things. And fishing game needs to kind of keep a serious or all of fishing game needs to keep a very serious mindset about it. But I can do the celebratory part a little more. And we have like right now in our app, you can go turn on every single river in the state or just the ones you care about. It sends you an alert every day tells you what the new number was. You don't have to go into the app that says Kenai River Chinook run today was 300. But what I can't wait to do is turn it on that says first fish entered the river. Right. New record was just set or you know just all these different fun things that we mm -hmm. can bring into the social fabric of the whole thing that you really probably couldn't do as a state. You need to keep it kind of on the on the serious side because there is a serious element to it. Mm -hmm. And you can't let those blur. Right. I guess my question is like on the state side, how do you how do you determine you know what's an important request to, to, to like build structures around what kind of noise you have to kind of <laughs> filter to keep focused on your mission? So that's that's a good question. I think the the way I I try to do everything is I try to run just the numbers on something. So if you are calling me about the six six cars or wherever it happens to be, it it might not be you know, top of mind to creating an app or, you know, sharing that data with people. But, you know, I try to just say, okay, you know, is this going to, is this going to be uh, doing something lean? Are we going to be changing a process where I can redeploy people to be doing other things? So that's basically. But, you know, speaking of the cars and things, I was thinking we have this stat page that is, like, really ugly and it's just full of data that I'm sure people would like to have, and a lot of times they ask for it, and it's already out there. You know, how do I get that information out to people? You know, how, how many electric cars we have, how many we have, you know, uh, somebody asked for DeLoreans the other day. <laughs> how many DeLoreans did we have? Like, how many? Really? There was six. It is. And then I was like, well, where are they? <laughs> I can help her respond to that a little bit because she's worked real closely with us. She sent us that angler survey. It's really well done work, and um, it's it's a body of work too. And they just encompass everything that they wanted to see and all of this stuff that we've been talking about today with the regulations and the legislation and accessing on mobile. All of that sort of stuff was all in that angler report. It's a really good it's really good work. Okay, our last question. For the department's head, have you? I don't see us uh, ever changing, especially in the current climate. As even as we argue, do we get a three thousand dollar PFD or not? That there's going to be 
money given to departments or to singular to actually take data and analyze and be able to use it at the state level. However, there's two ways. One, looking at it as a potential resource is that they looked at how it can be potentially, that it's a value. Google and all that make billions off of their data and they sell it. Has the state looked at what level can they sell data as a potential revenue to help maybe support the work and or looking at a way of making it much more accessible for innovators to be able to utilize it, maybe with the potential of, yes, you have all this access to this free stuff that you're now making money off of the, of the taxpayers, you have access to it, and you will need to pay, and I'm making up a number of 1% of your total revenue over 10 years, let's say. I don't know. Yep. Uh, so then get fed back into the data can. How are we as a state looking at data as a resource to prosper the development of business internally and externally? So I can start with that. Um, I probably get two data requests a day, you know, for two two data requests a day from different companies. We actually do uh, sell a lot of data. So we make about two million dollars a year that we put back mm -hmm. into the general fund just on selling your uh, vehicle data to different companies that are re that are, they have a valid reason to have it. You know, we have to check it and audit it. Uh, biggest one of the insurance companies and the hiring background checks. So if you want to get your driving records, you know, we're, we're selling all of those driving records electronically to those companies, LexisNexis, some of the big data um, data companies. So we do we do make a lot of revenue for the state. Just to give you an idea, Cal, just two million, just to give you an idea. I would, Google. Yeah. I have a lot more. California does. Oh, please. So, um, speaking from an enterprise level, the state is actively pursuing um, how, all of our revenue streams, right? What are the possible ways for us to generate revenue moving into the future? And um, one of the things that we've talked about with Data Hub, with enterprise architecture, which is connected to this summit today, is that data now across the world is seen as an asset. And so part of asset management is knowing what you have, how you preserve the life of it, and what revenue you can generate from it. So the state is, in fact, looking on an, at an enterprise level at the possibility of generating revenue through its data while protecting the data that should be shared. Um, you know, we want to make sure that there is very clear security lines drawn so that we're, we're not violating any um, statutes or um, any other types of regulations that require protection for certain types of data. What we're going to do today and tomorrow in this summit is begin the discussion about what kind of data would people want, right? What does Google know? Google knows what people want. Um, and there are examples of government being very successful. Georgia DOT um, shares its uh, 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 geospatial information data with Google. They have a contract. Google cares and stores for that information and is allowed to, to um, share it with the public for you know, a fee, right? So there are partnerships available for government to be able to leverage its data as a resource that can generate revenue. Um, I think there's a challenge there, though, because the people who, who pay for the data in the first place, the taxpayers, have to be careful how you're reselling the data. I also think you need to make it open initially to grow stuff. Weather data is a, is a government that was made open, and we use weather a lot. I think if you're hitting something 10,000 times a day, then a government should set up some kind of contract for like enhanced services to have the infrastructure to handle that. But, I, but uh, we should generate revenue, but we taxpayers paid for it in the first place. And so it's a, government's challenging because of, of how we're funded and, and what we're selling. Absolutely, and this is a great venue right here to start that discussion. Where are the lines? Where do we draw the lines? What's appropriate and what's not appropriate? Does anyone want to ask? Come on closer to the mic, and then we're going to break for lunch. 
And I would say that there's, in, in answer to that question, there's definitely this point where we have, when we're talking about our data and we're talking about value adds to our data, and when we're talking about value adds, we're looking at things like APIs. So it's when the state of Alaska has actually changed their data and created a service behind it. Um, that's when we can really start monetizing it. Um, other than that, we have, um, it is a, a public resource. And open data is a very important thing. So. All right, on that note, hopefully that has whet your appetite. I know it's not as funny as David is not human. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, <laughs> please enjoy lunch. It's upstairs.